This is how science could make Mewtwo. The world of Pokemon is all about being the very best trainer like no one ever was, but sometimes no matter how many rare candies you may have, your Pokemon just won't get strong enough. But that is where science might come in because almost a quarter of a century ago, Poke scientists like myself found something in the jungle and decided to apply genetic science to it in the hopes of creating one of the most powerful Pokemon of all time and they succeeded. But how exactly do you make a Mewtwo? Now where is that floating plushy cat baby thing? I wanna squeeze it. With its appearance in Detective Pikachu, Mewtwo, one of the Pokemon franchise's most iconic villains, is back in popular culture in a big way. And you can trace Mewtwo all the way back to the first Pokemon games in 1996 in red and blue, which even explain how Mewtwo came to be in a series of journal entries. But since Mewtwo is explicitly a product of science, let's figure out exactly what science it would take to create it step by step. And the first games are our first clue. The journal entries that you find on Cinnabar Island in the Pokemon Mansion, the place that has way too many Grimers in it, trace the origins of Mewtwo back to the Pokemon Mew, an extremely rare psychic floating kitten Pokemon that Poke scientists encountered in the jungles of Guyana, a real country in South America. The scientists then presumably captured Mew and brought it back to their laboratory, though the sequence of events isn't really clear. Although we know after this, that's when the experiment started. Takes, takes a lot longer without glitches. Then on February 6th, Mew get, what? I took like one step. Why is it always a Zubat? Not even worth it. Like I was saying, on February 6th, Mew gave birth. And from other Pokemon media, we know that Mew in fact gave birth to its own clone, a second Mew, a Mew 2. But this is where we have to transition from Pokemon science to real science. How could we possibly get an animal to give birth to its own clone? Well, we actually have a process in science that will do just that, called somatic cell nuclear transfer, which is a way of creating a viable embryo from body and reproductive cells. So if we wanted to make our own Mewtwo, what we would need first is some of those somatic cells from Mew, any one of its cells aside from its reproductive cells. Hey, wait, wait, don't leave me with all the Zubats! Canonically, Mewtwo was cloned from the somatic cells found in one of Mew's eyelashes. So with these somatic cells, we can start the process of somatic cell nuclear transfer, which sounds complicated, but it's exactly what it sounds like. Each one of the somatic cells in your body has a full copy of DNA inside of it. So if we wanted to clone an animal, we would first take one of its somatic cells and then extract that DNA from it. Then we want to birth the animal, so we want to put that DNA into something that can become an embryo and then an animal, like an egg cell. And if Mew is birthing something in the first place, it presumably has egg cells. So we take one of those and we remove its nuclear material. We then combine the egg and the material that we actually want, and then with a lot of luck and a little bit of literally an electric shock, we can get those cells to start dividing. We then put that cluster of cells into an animal that has the biology to birth those cells, in this case, Mew itself, and then eventually the clone would be born. This sounds all very sci-fi, I know, and it begs the question, despite what all this theory says, can we actually do this? Yep, meet Prometea, the world's first cloned horse, born as a clone of herself in 2003. And as of the time we're filming this episode, she is alive and well. And even a few years ago, she gave birth to her own beautiful baby horse. So this clone was definitely viable and all of this is possible. And if we can do this with a horse, we could clone a Mew. However, cloning a Mew is only the first step, and Pokey scientists would have to do a lot more than this to make Mewtwo so powerful. I swear, if this is a Zubat, I'm gonna lose my shit. Okay, good. If you're familiar with your Pokedex, you know that Mewtwo here is ultimately the result of recombining Mew's genes and subjecting Mewtwo to gene splicing experiments. Now, this all sounded like techno babble to me when I was a kid first playing through the games, but these are very real processes, and you're probably very familiar with them because we benefit from them literally every day. 
Recombining or splicing genes are terms used within so-called recombinant DNA technology, which is a way of taking DNA from outside of some host organism, inserting it into that DNA, and then hoping that the organism starts expressing those foreign genes. And this is the basic technology behind GMOs, or genetically modified organisms. I know this sounds scary to some people, but millions and millions of people every day benefit from GMOs through the creation of vaccines, through gene therapies, and through bacteria that synthesize human insulin because we modified them to do so. So Mewtwo then would technically be a GMO. What? No, I'm not gonna put a label on you. That's. That's just marketing. To truly make a Mewtwo, we're gonna follow the same process for genetic modification. And first, we'll need some genes from other powerful Pokemon that we want to insert into Mewtwo cells with the hope of it getting even stronger. If we wanna follow the Pokemon games to the letter, let's grab some genes from other powerful Pokemon that will give Mewtwo its eventual moveset. So let's grab some genes from Kadabra to give it Psychic, from Staryu to give it Recover, and maybe uh, Vaporeon to give it Mist. Then we grab those genes and cut them into tiny fragments with special enzymes that are like tiny genetic scissors. At the same time, we're gonna want something, a vector, that's able to actually get these DNA fragments into Mewtwo cells. One very common vector is a plasmid, which is a ring of DNA that we extract from the cells of bacteria, and then we use enzymes again to open up these rings to make them ready for those DNA fragments. Maybe we grab these plasmids, in this case, from something that's uh, used to transforming. Once the DNA is in the vectors, those vectors can be inserted into Mewtwo cells, which we extracted earlier, and then those cells can be reintroduced into Mewtwo's body. Hopefully, Mewtwo's body will then read these DNA instructions from these powerful Pokemon and start expressing all these new powers that we definitely wanted. Uh, oh, or did we? Uh, come on, super effective. Knowing how somatic cell nuclear transfer could birth a Mewtwo and how genetic engineering could make it the powerhouse that it is, this is my unified, scientifically accurate, and canonically correct theory for how Mewtwo was made. Here we go. Okay, so we take a somatic cell from Mew. We remove its nuclear material because that's the thing that we want to copy to make a clone. We then take Mew's egg cell, we remove its nuclear material, we combine the two. We then, with an electric shock, stimulate these cells into dividing. We then inject these cells back into Mew because it has the biology to birth a Mew embryo, and then eventually Mewtwo is born. From there, we take Mewtwo's cells, we remove some, and then from an array of powerful Pokemon, we cut up their genetic material for the genes that we want, we put it into a vector, and we put those vectors back into Mewtwo's cells. Those cells are put back into Mewtwo's body then, and then this process is iterated until eventually you get a Mewtwo that is expressing exactly the powerful genes in the way that you want. This is how you make Mewtwo. At least, that's how you'd make a Mewtwo in theory. In practice, it'd be a lot more difficult. In most cases, an organism treated with recombinant DNA technology doesn't just suddenly look and act different. In other words, its observable characteristics, its phenotype, doesn't really change before or after. And remember, Mewtwo was born as a clone of Mew, a genetically identical copy that would look just the same when it was born, like an identical twin. The changes you would need to impose on this animal in order to turn it from a cute space kitty into a armored tube kangaroo would be so substantial they would probably kill the animal. And just getting a clone of Mew in the first place would be very, very difficult. Think back to the first cloned horse, Prometea. She was the only single embryo to make it to full horsehood out of 841 attempts. To its credit, the Pokedex does say that Mewtwo was subjected to horrific gene splicing experiments and they would have to be. Poor tube kangaroo. Even if Poke scientists could clone a Mew and insert powerful genes, they would have to be extremely careful that those genes were expressed in the correct way. Once foreign DNA is inserted into a body, that body doesn't always express those genes correctly. For example, those Vaporeon proteins from earlier could be overexpressed 
or underexpressed or expressed in completely the wrong tissues. And according to the final journal entries in the Pokemon Mansion in red and blue, we know that something like this, underexpression, overexpression, the incorrect expression of genes, went wrong with Mewtwo. Genetic experimentation not only gave Mewtwo immense pokey power, it caused a psychological change in the animal, giving it vicious tendencies, which in theory, I suppose, is possible for misapplied genetic splicing to do. Mewtwo eventually destroyed the lab it was created in and then fled to lie in wait for only the strongest challengers and me with my level 65 Raichu. And hey, I get it. If I was experimented on my entire life with horrific gene splicing, I'd want to hide in a cave too. What, no, I just, it's a cool cave. It's just, it's just very backtracking and I'd never buy another escape rooms. Oh. Uh, so how do you make a Mewtwo? Well, with cloning and genetic modification. If pokey scientists use these very real and proven processes, they could do something close to what the games suggest. In real life though, we wouldn't be able to make an armored tube kangaroo with psychic powers because those powers aren't a thing, but we can and do accomplish Mewtwoian things with real organisms every single day. The real question here isn't whether or not we can can do something like genetic engineering and cloning, it's whether or not we can do so safely and ethically, because if we do not, then you can end up with a real pocket monster on your hands. Because science. If this is a Zubat, I'm deleting the channel. Gene splicing and gene experimentation is obviously highly technical. It's taken us decades and decades to get to this point, and uh, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. But what I like about science is that there's always room for a brute force approach to try it. So yes, we use these microscopic vectors from bacteria, and we put genes inside them, we insert them into cells and into animals, and we see what happens. That's very cool. But we also use gene guns, which are tiny guns that we load up with genes and we shoot genes into cells and see what sticks. I like that. Thank you so much for watching, Peter. It was a Geodude, by the way. If you want to follow us and give me ideas for future episodes, you can contact us through these social media handles on Instagram and Twitter. Also, the final episode of The Science of Mortal Kombat is now live. I'm very proud of the series, so go back and watch all six episodes and tell me, you know, just how you would have punched someone off the ground with more force than a car hits things with.